The basic technology behind the blockchain has been around for quite some time. Digital signatures since the 1970s, the timestamps, the, the chain since the 1990s. So we had the ingredients there. What made it really so impactful was this more recent innovation of the consensus algorithm, the first one proposed in the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. And that is the idea is that we agree on the truth. You know, in the digital world with all its misinformation and fake news, it's welcome that there's a counterbalance, something that we can all agree on. Now, I said the truth, it's truth very certain that there is never any truth, but at least there is a consensus. And if from now on, we would all agree to call dogs cats and cats dogs, then that would be that then we will just switch that around. So in the same sense, like there is constructs that we agree on in order to communicate with each other. How much money do you have? How much money do I have? How much currency? So that's just what we agree on. That's just a contract. A construct. At the end, the, the cryptocurrency, that, that information on that blockchain, on that ledger, that is the currency. There's no green piece of paper involved or anything. That's what it is. It's just an agreement of that you have something and I have nothing, for example. So whatever we put in here. And that is enabled by this hash function. So I want to talk more about the hash function today to in order to see why it's so important that we have this consensus algorithm that gives us this trustworthy, it's worthy to get our trust, our collectively trusted memory into the past. That's what we will talk about in this lecture. The hash function is involved in almost all aspects of the blockchain. So we said before, a blockchain is a ledger, an information record of digital signatures. And these are actually the only two where the hash function is not involved. An information record of digital signatures. That's 1970s technology. In everything else, the hash function uh, is involved. It's timestamped and it's uh, chained together. So that is with the blockchain. Then it's distributed and agreed on. That's the consensus algorithm. So the, the hashing in blockchain is part of all of these, except of ledger and digital signatures. Interestingly enough, the digital signatures, that's actually more general cryptography. Hashing is a part of cryptography and we call it crypto because of that. I mean, that's, that's where more crypto, crypto is. We, we should actually, I think we should call it hash currency, but that might be confusing. You might confuse it with a fried breakfast potato hash or with some recreational adult drug. So the hash currency, but that's maybe why they didn't call it hash currency, <laughs> but it's cryptocurrency. Okay. But the crypt, it's, it, there's a difference between hashing and encryption. Encryption means you can encrypt it and decrypt it. That's what you do with your public and private key and digital signatures. You encrypt it and you decrypt it, you write it and you read it. But hashing is goes only one way. So hashing, you basically hash it and it's infeasible to go backwards. It's not impossible, but as you will see, in this, uh, in this video, when mathematicians say it's not impossible, they be, for all practical purposes, they mean it's impossible. But the right term is, it's, in, it's very unlikely that you can go backwards, let's say like this. So it's a one-way function. So hashing is a one-way function, and that's important to understand. And, and that's where the magic comes from. We actually use it in many other applications. For example, when you save your passwords. So if you go into a social media site or into your email, you give it your name and you give it a password, password one, two, three, but then hopefully <laughs> the social media site doesn't store your password. I hope, I hope they don't. What they will store is they store a hash. They use a hash function to create a hash value and they hash it. And then what they store is basically only that thing. And it's infeasible for anybody who hacks their servers and finds this hash value here. It's infeasible for them to derive the password from it. That's why it's so safe. That's why you sometimes see like, oh, the server got hacked, we have a leak, but your passwords are safe. And you always think like, why? Isn't like, no, because your password is not on there. What's on there is a hash value that was created from your password. And you can go this one way, you can encode it this way, but it's infeasible to go backwards. And anybody who gets all these hash values, they cannot reconstruct the passwords. So basically what's, what's safe there is basically your username, and the hashes. 
you created that by having your password and with the hash function, you do that, but you cannot go back on it. So that's what we, we, we use it for. And that's a very common use, which is very useful. Otherwise, our pa- I mean, how often do servers get hacked that passwords would be everywhere and the digital age wouldn't really work? So what are some of the characteristics of this hash? And I already introduced some. First of all, maybe the most important one is that it has a quick verification, but it is infeasible to derive it. So once you have it, once you have the password, you put your password into the server, it's easy to say like, yes, then I use the same function again, a function or one-way function. So you put your password into the social media account, and then I can easily verify like I hash it and does it create the same value? Do I go from here to, to the same value? I can easily verify it once you give me that. So, but it's infeasible to go from this one backwards. So it has quick verification, but infeasible derivation. It gives a totally different output for even slightly different inputs. So even in your password, if you change a dot, the hash value will completely change. That makes it so difficult to go backwards. It's not that it changes proportionally something, like when you translate something between whatever, English and uh, and Spanish, then you're like, oh yeah, you change a word. The the thing is still the same kind of like, but no, it completely changes. You couldn't go backwards. You couldn't translate backward. And it has the same output for the same input. That's because it allows it to have quick verification. I'm a little redundant here just to hammer that point home. It's a quick verification. You have the, the same output for the same input so you can verify that your password created that hash value. And it has the same size. The output has the same size, no matter what the input. So for example, SHA-256 hash, that's a function, it always creates 64 symbols, hexadecimal symbols. So it's 64 hexadecimal symbols that it creates. Now, what I save on the blockchain is just that thing here. That's all I save on the blockchain. That's also why we can predict how big the Bitcoin blockchain will likely be. Well, it depends on how many of these you put on there, but you don't put like a video on the blockchain or an NFT picture on the blockchain, you basically just put the the hash value on the blockchain. It always has the same size, not matter if the input is a video, a monkey picture or a contract, for example. I want to explain to you a little bit more about the hash function because it's so important on the example of the consensus algorithm. The consensus algorithm has been the big innovation from Nakamoto, the Satoshi Nakamoto paper from 2008, the white paper that introduced the first modern application of what we call the blockchain proposed one consensus algorithm. And there are many, there are as many ways that we can agree on as we can disagree on and notoriously the infinite ways that we can disagree on (laughs) on things. So there are as many consensus algorithms as well. But they proposed one consensus algorithm uh, in 2008. And why do we need a consensus in the blockchain? Well, we have a block, we have an information record. And then the question is, What else do we write on the blog next? Like, how do we decide what to write on the blog? We might disagree on that. So with the consensus algorithm, we agree on what to write. And how do we agree? Well, we vote. And in the words of Nakamoto is, we vote with our CPU power, with the power of our computers. We compute, and that is called proof of work. We compute a lot and we put so much work into it. This is basically seen as a, a deposit you put down that you say like, no, I really, I'm serious. I'm gonna do this right. And when we agree on, we chain the next block to the chain. So that's why it's called a block chain, a block chain. So this is the question, how do we write the next block block on it? So Nakamoto, and that is only one consensus algorithm, but the first one proposed to vote with your CPU, with the proof of work. And how that works is, I explained that in a previous lecture as well, please check that out. It's basically, you can think about it, it's called the the mining. It's like I take a little coin and I fly with the airplane over the Rocky Mountains and I drop it somewhere on the airplane. And now the little coin is hidden in the Rocky Mountains. It's a very unique coin, we all know it. But now I say like, hey, take your shovel guys and go out there and look for it. Well, good luck. It's still more likely that you find that than that you find the the next, the right solution for the blockchain. But there you go. And you mine and you really look for this you know, little golden nugget, very unique nugget that you have in the entire Rocky Mountain range. And and you might find it. Now, it's very difficult to find, but once you have it, it's easy to verify. So let's imagine you found it and you run back and say, I have it, I have it. And we all see and look and it's like, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. But we say, oh no, that's it. Absolutely, there was only one there. 
I dropped only one from the airplane. So that's what you found? Well, that's what it found. It's, it's the one that we all know. And then you verify it, so it's easy to verify. And then we all like, yeah, that's it. Okay, so you get the honor to write the next block on the blockchain and you get a reward for it. We give you something for it. In that case, you get, you get Bitcoins when you do that. So that's the idea. Now, how does this game work? It actually, we don't fly over the Rocky Mountains and drop nuggets of gold. <laughs> we do a mathematical game. That's what the mining does. And it's not that game that I show you right now, but it's easy to think about it in this way. And it's analogous to some degree. So for example, I have the number 24. And I say, I want to factorize it. The same as I want to multiply some other numbers to get to the number 24. Now, what numbers come to your mind you can multiply to get to the number 24? How can you factorize that? Well, you could say two times 12, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I know I was not thinking about that. Think about another one. Well, you could think about three times eight. Yeah, that gives 24, right? But you can think about other ones. You can think about four times six, or you can think about whatever. So I say like, okay, write them all down, write all the possible factorizations of 24 down, and then try to guess what I have in my mind. Well, I have one in mind that starts with a bunch of twos. Nah, not so many, just with two twos. Oh yeah, okay, so that's the right solution. So once you found it, the right solution, then you get the reward. So basically what you do here with computers, you would do it, you would basically enumerate all the different ways you can do that. And the first one who founds the right solution gets the price. Now we can make that extremely difficult. In the Bitcoin blockchain, it's, it's the difficulty level, it's to such degree that it should be solvable every 10 minutes. And that depends on how many people participate. It depends on their on the computational power that's in there. But you know, we can we can adjust that. So we can drop a bigger nugget of gold. Imagine we would drop, let's say, a hundred feet nugget of gold in the Rocky Mountains. You probably find that quicker than if I have a one inch nugget of gold hidden in the Rocky Mountains. So we can adjust the speed of how we can solve, how quickly we can solve that problem. And if nobody solves it, and nine and a half minutes have passed we make it a little easier. So that's just how it's set up, but we solve a mathematical problem. Now, how difficult is it to solve this problem? Well, extremely difficult. So we also find in this case, we don't find some kind of solution that has a lot of twos. It usually has to start with a lot of zeros. And I just recently looked it up. Right now we are here at, you know, we have to find 20 zeros, I think at the beginning, you have to find a number with 20 zeros or 19 zeros at the beginning right now in the Bitcoin blockchain, that's what it is. And the chance that you find that is one million, 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 million to one. Well, that's a big, that's a big number. How big is that? Well, if you would drive in a car blindfold and you have a coin in your hand and you throw it blindfold out of your window and you try to hit a hair that there's outside, let's say I have a hair one millimeter thin and I hold it outside of the window of your car and you blindfold try to throw the coin and try to hit that one millimeter hair. Well, let's try to play this game. And that's a little bit more difficult than that because the car is not still. So I have this hair posted on the way, but you are driving and you're driving with 80 miles an hour, 130 kilometers an hour. So let's imagine you drive, uh, the largest distance I found was from Hong Kong to Lisbon. You drive 9,000 miles. That's three times driving from the East Coast to West Coast in the United States. And you can probably do that once a week, if you drive 16 hours a day. So you sleep eight hours and the rest you drive. And then you can drive that once a week, right? You drive with 130 kilometers an hour, 80 miles an hour, once a week there. And I hit, have the hair hidden once. And you get once the chance to throw that coin out and if you're lucky, you hit the hair. But who knows where to throw it out? Maybe when you pass by Rome or when you pass by Istanbul, I don't know where you pass by. You know, at what point are you gonna throw that hair out? Now, actually, it's not you drive that once or twice, you drive that for 1.6 trillion years, once a week, at once, once a week, yes. And you throw the coin out only once. Or you drive 8 million times since the first modern human came about. 200,000 years ago, or you drive 116 times since the Big Bang. <laughs> so since the Big Bang, you drive 160 times back and forth between Lisbon and Hong Kong, and you only get one chance to blindfold it, throw the coin out of the window and hit that hair. That's the likelihood of finding the right hash value to get the honor to put the next block on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now that is very unlikely that you're lucky. Not impossible, 
you know, that's when mathematicians say the word like impractical or infeasible, or they say in theory, and he's like, oh no, it's still a theory. Well, listen, for, when mathematicians say that for all practical purposes, it's impossible. But let's don't use the word because you might be very lucky. You might drive there since the Big Bang 116 times and hit that hair blindfolded. Good for you. But it's, you, you know what I mean. So we actually adjust the difficulty level on this blockchain to make it work actually for somebody to solve it at least like once every 10 minutes or so. Thank you very much. So that's what we do. So doing these calculations is certainly very energy intensive. I mean, like going out in the Rocky Mountains with all these people, like many people try to solve this puzzle, trying to find this number with all the zeros that it starts with. And so for the 10 minutes, a lot of CPUs, a lot of computers are running, or different computers, doesn't have to be CPUs nowadays, and tries to solve this problem. And same as it takes a lot of energy to, if, if a lot of people run into the Rocky Mountains looking for a nugget of gold, you need a lot of food and, 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 and water for that. You also need a lot of electricity to run all these computers mining for the next solution there. And you can critique that, but this mechanism that Nakamoto came up with is the most secure mechanism we have come up with yet. There are others, and I'm gonna mention a second one now, but until now, proof of work is really like nobody ha has ever fussed with that. Like we get, it's not it's not breakable. So that's a good thing. And you could argue if it's worth it to have Bitcoin wasting so much energy. Well, yeah, we waste energy on a lot of things. YouTube, according to the numbers I saw, uses twice as much energy than the Bitcoin network. So what does YouTube do? I mean, I love my YouTube videos, but Bitcoin provides a global property solution uh, to people who usually don't have a property. So you might argue, argue in favor of that. Or gold mining, like real gold mining, like real gold mining uses twice the energy than Bitcoin mining uses. So what value does gold have? So people are arguing Bitcoin is half than gold and half is YouTube. Well, all right, that's, that's, that's still okay, some might say. But still, it's a lot of energy expenditure. It's really bulletproof. So that's why people really still like it and we still use it, Bitcoin. But the alternatives. And one alternative is called proof of stake. The second biggest cryptocurrency, Ethereum, the second biggest blockchain for that matter, because cryptocurrencies as for now, Ethereum has started out as proof of work, very energy intensive. And then in 2022 has migrated to proof of stake. And proof of stake uses much less energy. And how can you think about that? Okay, the question is again, who gets the honor to write the next block on the blockchain? Now, how do we solve that? We can all do a lot of work and then have our sweat equity in it. Or what they say is, well, you just put the stakes in the middle of the table, right? You like your poker chips. You put them in the middle of the table and then we'll see, like if you put your money where your mouth is. And if we all validate you, we all, these are called validators, then we validate you and we see what you do. And if you mess up, then we are gonna burn your chips. Basically, you're going to slash them. That's a technical term. And you lose all your chips. Now, if you don't put enough chips on the table, we're not even going to start with giving you a chance for that. So there's a randomness, not, not the one who puts the most chip gets the next take uh, automatically. There's a randomness involved. But if you want to play that game, you need a lot of chips, you need a lot of stakes. So people create staking pools. And that's where the famous staking comes in. When you stake your cryptocurrency, you give it to somebody who plays the stake. You better watch out who you give your, your, your cryptocurrency to stake because they might gamble with it and, and not do the right thing and then it gets slashed and your you know, state cryptocurrency will be burned. So that's another story, but that's the idea. You basically put a big deposit down. You put a big deposit down and say like, hey, trust me guys, and you can have the deposit if I'm lying. And well, then we validate you. And in that, Ethereum migrated down to, to a small percentage. Can you see that here? So this is a Bitcoin, how much energy it uses. This is our theorem before, and then it migrated. I hopefully you can see this down here and it decreased in 2022 by 99.95%. So it uses now a fraction of what even PayPal uses. So and then you can think, but Ethereum is, is, is much more flexible than PayPal and uses a fraction of the energy. So just to be clear. And that was a really big engineering piece. I actually, uh, I stayed awake that night because I watched it. Well, for the nerds of us, this, these things are very, these things are very exciting because the Ethereum blockchain is decentralized, right? So you cannot stop it. There's nobody really in charge of it. It's just running. It's like, imagine it's a big fleet of airplanes flying in the air at full speed and you exchange the engine while they are flying. 
And it, uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing piece of engineering orchestrated collectively. And they got it done, really pulling my head. It was, it was a cool. I think it took two nights for them to do it. It called the merge and they transitioned it from proof of work to proof of stake. It was an amazing piece of engineering. And so here we call them validators. So we put the chips in the middle and we validate you. So in, in proof of work, we call them miners and here we call them validators. Now there are many more ways of creating consensus. As I always say, there is many way to agree as to disagree, and there are many ways to disagree. So, and other consensus algorithms are out there, but these are the two most important ones. Here we have this wonderful blockchain demo from Anders Brownworth, and I wonder how this uh, works. Well, how does it work? Well, every time I type something, as you can see, the hash below there completely changes. So when once I found the message that I want to mine, that I want to put into this block, then I mine it. And we do, in this case, a proof of work. We look for some hash function with a certain number of zeros. And that's what it found. Now, if I change just a little tiny bit here, the hash function changes completely. And I can see if I, no, it's always a different one. But if I go back to the original one, what the hash value here confirms is that this is the information that we had. And feel free to rewind the video and convince yourself that that is the hash that represents this sentence. Now, what we can do is we convert this into a block chain. For example, if I start with the first block, that's usually called the Genesis block, the, the, the block zero, then I can see that the next block refers back to it. So this first block, the hash was 0005FD ending in 81. And here we have the 005FD ending in 81. So that's how they make a chain out of it. I mine this one now uh, and I get, once I found the hash function, a value that I then here put into the third one. Now the amount of information or the kind of information that I put in here is completely arbitrary. A hash function is one way function that is always the output has always the same size. So I can put something huge in here. For example, the famous paper from uh, Harbor and Stonetta from 1991, and I can mine this entire thing. The output of the hash will always be the same size. Now, I want it to be computationally efficient. You see here, well, that takes a little bit longer and you can adjust the size depending on how many zeros you have to guess. So in Bitcoin, you aim at that block is mined like within 10 minutes, more or less. You can ju it's just the level of difficulty and you want to make the computation efficient. But you can see this here is much more information than that was here. However, the output of the hash is, is exactly the same size. This sa same number, it could be three three letters or 20 hesi decimal or whatever you want. And that makes the amount of information that's on the blockchain very predictable because we don't store this here on the blockchain. We just store the hash and the hash uniquely, well, I can change that. Oh, no, here we go. That was it. It uniquely identifies some kind of information that can be stored somewhere else. For example, what I can put on the blockchain is I say that I just wanted to let everyone know that I own the original photographs of Pele's bicycle kick from 1965. Now, I don't put the picture of Pele's bicycle kick on there, but the certificate of ownership. And that makes it efficient to store that on the blockchain. So that's, let's call that an NFT to just to give it a name. Or I can put some other information. For example, if someone is crazy enough to give me one trillion coins, the photograph is yours. Uh, this contract will be automatically executed as soon as the condition is fulfilled. So this smart contract here, I can put some contractual information on, on the blockchain. Let's call that a smart contract. Now, what if I change something? So for example, oh my goodness, I just realized I misspelled bicycle here. How embarrassing. And I hope the contract is still valid because actually that's how you spell bicycle, right? Oh, oh now, oh, every block after that also got changed. So because it's not the, it's not the original one, the original one was was this here and but I hope my contract is still valid so let's change that what I have to do then is I have to remine the entire thing and just mine this here it gets me a number that's not verified it doesn't start with enough zeros so we only take the numbers that start with a certain number of zeros and I have to redo the entire mining work which is very energy efficient in proof of work and in proof of stake it just need a lot of stake so if you change something back here then every block after that gets changed. And that's how 
I create an unmutable past, basically, by chaining these different blocks of information together and making sure that nobody can change history. So now that we have a blockchain, the next question is how do we agree on what to put next as the next block onto the chain? Uh, and that's where Anderson Brownsworth beautiful blockchain demo, which I invite you to visit, has another part of the demo that shows us how a distributed blockchain system actually works. And so what we have here is the Genesis block and uh, we mine that. So this one, if we find one with sufficient zeros, is now mined. And now we can do that uh, in another copy. So if you mine the same input, it will give you the same hash value. So this hash value will be, be the same using the same hash uh, function. So blocked uh, Bitcoin, for example, uses SHA-256. And there is a myriad of, of different hash uh, functions around there. Uh, and now we connect it to the next one and we have different copies. Actually, these are not copies. There's no copy or original. I mean, the original is the one from the miner who won the competition in that case or the staker and the other one validated just by, it's very easy. It's very difficult to find, but it's easy to verify. Once you have that, you can verify that this is the information it encodes. So now let's say in the next block we write, I have three images. So I mine that this is now connected. And if the other ones can validate that message that I have three images, they will get the same hash value than than the other than the previous one and so this when we have distributed uh, this information now if they all agree that i have three images then you know they should all be fine and they should this these these hash values in these different chains should all look the same so this one starts with 0007b3 ends here with five exclamation marks 0007b3 ends with five exclamation marks okay so we all agree what if this middle uh, guy now says, well, look, look, I have only two images, or let's say I have nine images. Well, that won't agree then anymore. And here we can now verify and have some kind of consensus mechanism that the majority rules. For example, you could say 51%. That's where the infamous 51% attack comes from. If 51%, if the majority of people say that you have three images, or if the majority of people would say you have nine images, then you could change the course of history. You couldn't change it with some maybe more or less corrupt intermediary, but you could change it by actually you know, taking over the majority of the world. You might say in that sense, right? So now here, this is mined, and the nine images encoded in 000, 000 2 ED, and um, here's 0, 0, 0, 2 ED, and now suddenly, well, this person with the three images is, this doesn't agree anymore. It still represents, it still represents the previous blockchain, but we have it now connected in time and in space as well. And this is now the majority that agrees that, well, you have nine images. And of course, the first killer application to that, and that also an Anders Brownsworth application demo, is, the, is to use this same thing for finances. So if you have now here a ledger of finances with different digital signatures in here, these are the different people, let's say they signed all of that and say like, yeah, that's really, I agree with that. And somebody would like to change something, let's say Kane gave to Ash not 61 cents, but only 60 cents. Well, then you see this detects where the potential problem lies. So this hash value doesn't agree anymore with the other hash values. Now, since, what was it, 61? Yeah, then we go back. That's That seems to be the truth. Everybody agrees on that. And now you can see as well, since they're all connected in a chain, you can, for example, in financial transactions, it's very important not to do double spending. You can now get back and say like, well, can Kane actually spend 84? What happened before here? Did, did Cain ever have 84? So you need to first, maybe in the Genesis block, record who put something into the network and that can be created out of thin air because you can create the tokens or the coins or you can deposit it. And then uh, if, if Cain wants to make a transaction, Ash says, well, let me first of all check on this transparent blockchain if you have that kind of money and if I can trust you with that. And that's how you can both uh, have an agreement in time through the chain and in space through the distribution of it. And with that, without the need of a third party intermediary, trust, let's say, call it a trustless system, trust the system that Kane really does have that money or does have that image or has that whatever he or she put into the smart contract in order to be executed.